stories of Jesus are parables. And the parables are earthly stories that are given not to entertain us or to mesmerize us or any of that. Uh, these stories are given to illustrate truth. And so the story is not the point. They lead to the point. And that's what we want to look at today. One of the stories of Jesus. Now, it's found in a context about forgiveness. Now, uh, who here has never, ever made a mistake? I didn't see any hands go up. Uh, if you made a mistake, that means you need some forgiveness for that mistake. It's amazing, though, how sometimes we get so proud and arrogant that they, we don't need to say, I'm sorry, I've blown it, I've made a mistake, forgive me for the wrong that I have done. The story is about this, okay, about forgiveness. The first thing that I want to notice is that there's two main characters in the story. Actually, there's more characters in it, but there's two main characters. And they both need forgiveness. The first one is now one of the Pharisees. In the Gospel of Luke, where this is found, chapter 7, says, now one of the Pharisees, now you've got to get the picture, the Pharisee, the Pharisee in the ancient world would be the good church goer in our world. Okay? Uh, the person who tries to do everything right. Everything right. I mean, the Pharisees tried to keep the law so intently that, remember the one that you're not to work on the Sabbath day, but remember to keep it holy. They had rules that you couldn't walk in our, in our distances more than two miles on the Sabbath day. If you, okay, so some of you are wearing your Fitbit and you know you walk over two miles. <laughs> if you walk over two miles on the Sabbath day, that is excessive and that was work and you were sinning. If you stuck on a tack on the Sabbath day and a tack stuck in the bottom of your sandal, you couldn't pull it out to the next day because that would be excessive working on the Sabbath. See, this was extreme, extreme. Now, now the Pharisees were extremely pious and religious. They tried to do everything absolutely right. And besides the Ten Commandments and the 613 Commandments in the Bible, they, they expanded that even to their own commandments. And, and, and it was a system of rules of do's and don'ts. Highly legalistic. You get the picture? And so they were doing everything correctly. But this self-righteous Pharisee, that's what he is, he needed forgiveness, just like everyone else. But he didn't know it. Because he was so self-righteous, he did everything so right, and he compared himself to what they called the sinners. That was everyone who didn't keep up to all the standards that the Pharisees had set. And so he didn't know. He needs forgiveness, but he doesn't know it. The second person in our story that I want to focus on is one a woman. She's anonymous. It's an anonymous woman. Some people try to sign it to be Mary, one of the Marys of the Bible. It's not. She's an anonymous woman. She's just a woman who had lived a sinful life. Get the picture here? The Bible doesn't go into what kind of sin she had been involved in. But it leads us to believe that she had probably been an adulterous woman, or she had been a prostitute, or she had at least been a lady of the night, a lady of the street, and she had lived in a, in a sinful lifestyle. She knew it, and everyone else knew it too. She had a bad reputation. She also needed forgiveness, and she showed it. The self-righteous Pharisee, he needed it, but didn't know it. She needed it, She's about to show it that she needs forgiveness. The self-righteous Pharisee, he didn't know it, but forgiveness was so near to him, and yet he was so far away. Some people miss forgiveness by just 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches. That close. They, they come that close to it. The distance between their head and their heart they know what to do, all the self-righteous things to do, but they really don't believe that they need to confess uh, all the wrongs that they've done. And so they miss it because they don't do 
tested. Now listen. Now one of the Pharisees, he invited the self-righteous Pharisee, he invites Jesus to have dinner with him. Of course he would. Jesus is known as one of the great rabbis. He's a master teacher. And it was a very common thing for the Pharisees to include and invite to a party a, a well-known, reputable rabbi or teacher to his home as a guest to do some teaching. And of course, there were no glass panes or thermal pane windows and none of that. And so people would gather around the house. So they, the commoners who weren't invited, they would listen in to hear. Maybe they could get a kernel of truth from the great rabbi that was at the meal. Got the picture? He's invited his distinguished rabbi, rabbi and, and uh, pharisaical friends, and he's invited Jesus. And Jesus, he knows this man needs forgiveness like everybody else needs forgiveness. And he goes. He goes to the dinner and says, Jesus, he went to the dinner with the Pharisee's house. He reclined at the table. Now in the picture here, I don't have him reclining. Uh, the photographer who ever took this didn't stage him correctly. Um, they didn't sit at chairs like we do, okay? Uh, they had long couches and they leaned down and they were on one elbow and they would eat with one hand and so their feet were, were away from the table. And, and it was the whole, but the, um, you know, moderate photographers set up everything kind of like, like most of the time, Jesus looks white, doesn't he? He's a white Italian guy. <laughs> no, he wasn't. He was a Middle Eastern. He was Middle Eastern. He's probably dark complected. And whenever you have a picture of Jesus looking like, it probably wasn't what he looked like at all. Okay. And, and so, but, but in order to help us stimulate our mind and identify with the story, we not use these pictures. But there he is. He went to and he's sitting, and, and, but he's that close. This self righteous Pharisee is face to face with Jesus. Kind of like the churchgoer who every Sunday is face to face with the Word of God, with Jesus, through the preaching of the Word, and then leaves this place forgetting he's been with Jesus. Wow. He is so close in this story, we're going to find you so far away. Now, a sinful woman, she wasn't invited. Women were not invited to these ordeals. That's just the way it was at that, at that time. But she was probably standing outside with all the other people, hoping to hear a word. Now, I know, I know from the, the harmonies of the gospel that the event that took place prior to this, Jesus had made a statement where he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. She she probably heard that. I, I don't know for certain. But she has come to Jesus, but she knows it's custom. I can't intrude. And so when the, when the woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought him an alabaster jar of perfume. I don't know if this is where the custom has come, that when you're invited to a home and you're a guest, that you bring a small token gift. Do you ever notice how people do that? I think it may go all the way back to this, but I'm not sure. Anyway, she, she takes a gift because she plans to intrude on the party. Why? She wants to get near the one who has forgiveness. She's a seeker. Now, she comes with an attitude I call worthy of forgiveness. It's a contrite attitude. Now, the word contrite means a broken spirit. Repent, contrition. Um, you, you are just down in your spirit. And why would that be? She knows she is a sinful woman. She's got brokenness in her life. I don't know why she became a lady of the street. I don't know if she had a bad childhood. She was rejected by, by her father. I don't know if she was one of those that said, well, then if, you're, if I can't, if I can't have the love of a man, I'm just going to go up and have my own man, and I'm going to raise him up, and then I'll have a son that I'll love, and I'll have the love of a man. I don't know what went on in her mind. I do not know any of that. But she is broken. She knows it. She, she, she knows that she has sinned against God, and, and things are not right, and there's this tension, and she's fallen out with God and God's graces, and, and she knows that her life is a mess. 
she comes in, she intrudes, she sneaks up behind Jesus. Still, again, I got the picture a little wrong. He would have been reclining. She's behind Jesus. He, she thinks he doesn't know he, that she's there. Of course, this is God covered the flesh. He knows everything. She sneaks up behind him, and she begins to weep. She senses her guilt, her shame, her failure, her brokenness, her lostness, her unworthiness. She senses her sinfulness because she's in the presence of the Holy One, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When was the last time you came into the presence of Jesus in your prayer? Sensing how needy you are, how broken you are, how messed up you are, and how totally holy he is. Get the picture? She's weeping, she's crying, she's got tears, she's got tears. She began to wet his feet with her tears. You see, in the custom of the day, when, when you had guests in your home, you would have a servant wash your guests' feet. They wore sandals and there was no paved streets. If they were, they were stone. And everybody just threw their trash out in the street. They were dirty. They were, well, you know, all of that was in the street. And when you walked and you've got open shoe sandals, your feet get dirty. They do today. And we got paved streets. We got paved sidewalks. We got all that. And the feet were dirty, so it was custom was you wash your guests' feet when they came into your house. Our custom is take your shoes off because you don't want to get your soil on everybody's carpet. We, we, we got our own little custom. Well, this was you wash the feet. You would assign a servant, at least he would, this Pharisee, as he's having this banquet. He, he had somebody washing feet. And she comes up. I think that's why she brought the perfume jar. She's planning to put it on the washed feet, but she discovers Jesus' feet are dirty. And she's crying. And, and her tears are dropping, and, 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 she, and so she's going to, she wet his feet with her tears, and then she didn't expect to have to wash the feet, so she takes her long hair, and she begins to wipe his feet with her hair, and then she kisses his feet. In every culture, Kissing is a token of love. That's what it is. She is expressing her love for Jesus by kissing his feet, and then she brought, the, the perfume she brought, she pours out on his feet. Here it is a woman who's got actions to adore, praise, worship, the God, the Son of God, in the flesh, in all of her brokenness and unworthiness, realizing all of his holiness and worthiness. And she had an attitude that fosters forgiveness. On the other hand, there was the attitude of unworthiness, an attitude of unworthy for forgiveness, a self-condemning self-righteous, condemning attitude and action on the part of the Pharisee. The Pharisee who invited him saw this and he said to himself, did you notice that he didn't say out loud? You ever talk to yourself? Yeah, all that? I say, hey, you know, I say, hey stupid, what'd you do that for? I mean, you guys don't know why I say that to myself, but you know, yeah, we talked to ourselves. And what I just said was like, uh, I just put myself down, put myself in my place. Not so with him. He said to himself, huh, if this man Jesus knew we were really a prophet, he would have known touching who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a... Now, little did he know that Jesus is really a prophet. And as it says in John chapter 2, he didn't know any, didn't need anyone to tell him what was in man because he knew 
what was in man. Jesus knows what was in him. So Jesus has this insight because he's the son of God. And Jesus answered him and says, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, well, tell me, teacher. And here's what he gets. The parable, the story. Jesus is a master. Two men owed a man. I got two men up here. We don't know who they are. They're in a story. So they could be made up. They could have been real. We don't know. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. The one owed him 500 denarii. We don't know what a denarii is, so I put $500 out there, okay? The one guy owes him 500 bucks. He said, and the other one owed him $50. Why? Well, neither one of them, he said, had the money to pay him back. They're broke. You pull your pockets out. Oh, I got nothing. So they're, they're subject to judgment, okay? Uh, they're, they're subject to to be imprisoned in that day for not paying their debts, okay? So, whoa, they're in big trouble. So, the money lender canceled the debts of both of them. Whoa, you know what we call that? Forgiveness. If a bank forgives your loan, it's canceled, it's gone, it's, it's over. And so then Jesus says, now which of these men love the money lender the most? Which one loved him the more? Well, Simon replied, Oh, I suppose the one that had the bigger debt canceled. Is that what you would have answered? Yeah, it's only logical. Oh, yeah. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. You're right. And then he adds this. The application. The application goes like this. He just told us the story. And the point was to bring about the fact of what the girl there was doing versus what he was doing. And here we go. Then he turned toward the woman. I find this very interesting. Jesus turns towards the woman, but he speaks to Simon. He turns to her. He speaks to Simon. He says, do you see this woman? Of course he did. She just intruded his party. Do you don't think the, the, the guy that's hosting the party knows, notices a party crasher? Of course he noticed her. He said, I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. This was a cultural sin of omission. He, did, he omitted to do what he knew he should do. He didn't do it. There are two kinds of sins. Sins of omission and sins of commission. But I know to do good and do it not to me it is sin. It says that in the book of James. To him that knoweth to do good and does it not to him it is sin. So I'm driving down the road and I see a car stuck in the snow. It happened just this last week. And I'm thinking, should I stop or shouldn't I? Should I be the good Samaritan and help push that car? And so as I'm slowing down making this decision, God answered it for me. Some lights go on. And I, and I see a, a police officer pull over and he's got these big bumpers on it. Well, I'm, I'm slowing down the siding. He pulls up behind his car and gives him a push. I said, thank you, Lord, I didn't have to get out of the cold. <laughs> but if I just sit by and I knew I should stop, <coughs> to him who knows to do good and does it not to him, it is sin. For this man to know I should wash his feet and I don't do it, what is it? He said, you did not give me any water, but she on my feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair. Listen, you did not give me a kiss. That's common courtesy. Today what we do, we don't give each other a kiss. Greet one another with a holy kiss, what the Bible says. I watched this morning, nobody kissed anybody coming in. But we all shook hands because that's our cultural norm. But if you withhold your hand, you know that you're, you're, you're angry at somebody, you withhold your hand to him that knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin. You did not give me a kiss and she has this woman. From the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put, off, put oil on my head. Usually there would be some refreshing, something there to refresh from your journey. You did not do that. But she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, here's the conclusion that he's drawing to the story. Therefore, her many sins have been forgiven. He starts with the conclusion, and, and, and here, and, and the, the bottom line, the total bottom line of this, 
her sins are forgiven. Now he's going to work backwards in, in this, after he told the parable, he's going to work backward to why her sins are forgiven. All right? All right? Here's the explanation. Why he came to this conclusion, her sins are forgiven. For she loved much. She loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Man. I have found over the years, those people who have lived a very sinful lifestyle and then genuinely come to Christ, love the Lord far, far more with deeper thankfulness and gratitude for their salvation than those who have grown up with it all their lives. Both are equally saved, but the one has far more thanksgiving. Now, the self-righteous Pharisee was as guilty as this woman, only in an opposite extreme. And he could have been just as loving and thankful as she was out of his opposite extreme, but he was not. Who has been forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, here's a pronouncement, your sins are forgiven. Do you know how you know if your sins are forgiven or not? I know that my sins are forgiven the same way she knows her sins are forgiven. Jesus told her so. Well, how did Jesus tell me? Well, he told me right here in this book. All you got to do is go to 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I know that my sins are forgiven the exact same way she knew her sins were forgiven because God told her so. When I confessed my sin, he forgave me. He told me so. Right there in his word. Now the guest's reaction. All the other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? You see, they didn't even know who he was. So close and so far away. So close and so far away. Jesus' reaction is this. When Jesus said to the woman, and you would expect him to have said here, your love has saved you. But he doesn't. He says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She came in all this brokenness, and she goes in all this peace. She comes in with a messed up life, and she goes out with a whole new life. And here's how the conclusion was, you were forgiven. You loved much, you were forgiven. You believed your faith has saved you. You, you, you believed in me, you loved me, you were forgiven, you go in peace. The conclusion is, you are forgiven because you've been saved. You've been saved. You've been saved. So what do we learn from this parable of our Lord, this story? I take four lessons with me. Number one, you can be religious and not be saved. Do you realize that? That Pharisee was as religious as you could possibly be. But he was not saved. To be saved, you have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior from your sins. You have to have faith. It takes a contrite, a genuine contrite, that's what she had, a contrite, broken faith of our unworthiness and the worthiness of the Savior. It takes that contrite faith in a Savior to be forgiven. It's not just some head knowledge that I know all about Jesus. No, it takes a little bit lower right here, a heart knowledge. In the book of Romans it says that if we confess with our heart, or with our mouth, and believe in our heart, I wear my heart, not my head. If I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. I have to have that genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to be forgiven. The next thing I learned from this is you must be forgiven to experience real love. Real love. 
You only love to the degree you experience the forgiveness of God. The greater my forgiveness, the deeper my love. That's what Jesus said. The greater your forgiveness, the greater your love. The greater your love. So let's pray. Father in heaven, there may be someone right here right now says, you know what, I've been playing games, I'm a Pharisee. It's time for me to have that broken, contrite, spirited faith. Where I acknowledge my unworthiness and your total worthiness. And I accept you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe that you died for my sins and paid the price. I accept your forgiveness. I accept it. Save me, O Lord. Well, Lord, I know anyone would pray anything similar to that from their heart. Where they express they truly believe in you. And you would say to them, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The messed up life is over. I give you my peace. You're on a new journey. The old has gone. The new has come. You are now in Christ. Lord, may we learn from this to be like Christ. Sharing the message that if you just believe in Jesus,